The term king of the south is something that's been heard, heard among us for a long time. But I would suggest that probably there's quite a few that's not quite sure why we speak about the king of the north and the king of the south. But if we've got that uh, Daniel 11 open, it, it helps us a lot to see what the whole sense of it is. It's taken from this chapter. So in verse 40, as we started the reading this afternoon, it says, At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. And the reaction of the king of the north is this, that the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. In the uh, context of this, of chapter 11 that is, uh, there is a debate or a contest going on between two kings. You probably remember that Alexander the Great had four sons and the kingdom, the Greek kingdom was divided into those four portions when he died. And after some years there was only two, two of them left, effectively. One was the Seleucid kingdom that was in the north and the other was the kingdom of the Ptolemies which was in Egypt and the south. And sitting between them, of course, was the glorious land. And so there was a contest between the Seleucids of the north and the Ptolemies of the south, and that was the king of the north and the king of the south. Just to emphasise that, and I think this is a useful thing to have in your mind, if you come to chapter 11, you'll see how many times those expressions are used. It's the story of chapter 11. So when we pick it up there in verse 40, it's got all this background behind it. It helps to see that, doesn't it? Verse 5, And the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, etc. It goes on to verse 6, The king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north. It's there again in verse 8, He shall continue more years than the king of the north. And verse 9, So the king of the south And so it goes right through this chapter on that kind of thing. Then finishes, I might say, in verse 40. So verse 40 is the end of a story that was played out in history between those two powers back 300 years before Christ, going up towards more like 150 years before Christ. So verse 40 then has taken a jump, obviously, hasn't it? It's not about the Seleucids. It's about the time of the end. There's no question about what time it's about because it says in verse 40, it's the time of the end. In other words, the end of this oscillating contest between north and south is going to be, verse 40, the time of the end. Chapter 12, verse 1 makes that even more obvious, doesn't it? Because having given us the last chapter, it says in verse 1 of chapter 12, and at that time... Shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people? And that it is a a cumulative thing, a final issue, is plain from what follows. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. How delivered? Because of resurrection. Verse 2. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now that's very important context if we want to understand what verses 40 to 45 are about. They have to do with the time of the end, the time of resurrection, when the time of one like unto God, Michael, is going to stand up both in the sense of the principle of the, of the angels and, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ who was the image of God. Well, what sets, what sets off this climatic descent of the king of the north? Verse 40. It says, Yet at that time of the end shall the king of the south push, push at him doesn't sound very adventurous, does it? It shall push at him. It's very different to the picture that we have in so much of the rest of this chapter, like, for example, verse 25 of chapter 11. 
much more dramatic. He shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army and the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army. Very different language in the beginning of verse 40. The offering that's made by the king of the south is relatively mild. It says that he will push at him. And yet, that was sufficient to set off the king of the north. In other words, the spirit and strength of mind of the king of the north was in excess of the king of the south. And it stirs him to to really overreact, we might say, compared to the the, um, defence that the king of the south made towards him, or the mild offence that he made towards the king of the north. He is infuriated by that. Now, I think that's interesting because of this one quality about Putin that becomes more and more obvious, it is that he loves a challenge. He, st- he sets us back on nothing, does he? If there's somebody that offers some uh, criticism, whatever way it might be in terms of defence or military, military exercise or words in the press, then you can be sure that Putin will respond and respond in very great strength. You know, we've had a man in the last uh, couple of years that's been prepared to use expressions that no one has been prepared to use for many years. Don't mess with Russia. We're a nuclear power. What's the threat behind that? We're talking about nuclear power, my dear brothers and sisters. This is a man's glib comment. Don't mess with us. We're a nuclear power. We haven't had anyone perhaps not even uh, North Korea, that uh, would have offered such uh, enormously challenging words as that. Don't you breach with me, he says. And, you know, in, in three times in one week, they offered the comment that we could take the Baltic states overnight. And I think they could. But what, a, what an incredible comment to make publicly to a world that's already very nervous about the instability that's throughout the world at this time. Our forces could absorb the Baltic states in 24 hours. Now that's exactly the kind of mind that we would expect. It's a very challenging mind, determined and arrogant. It's go. It's a spirit of great revenge. If we come over to Ezekiel, Not to spend much time in Ezekiel 38, Carl. (laughs) But uh, we're trying to be careful not to run over each other. But uh, in Ezekiel chapter 38, it's not until verse 14 that the whole matter gets underway, is it? Have you realised that? It's not until verse 14 that the prepared go launches his event. He's been peacefully, apparently, scheming. He has an evil thought and he's been scheming his way. And verse 14 then opens up the new chapter of events. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, thus saith the Lord Yahweh, in the day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, thou shalt not know it, And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts. He still hasn't moved yet. This is commentary upon it. It's very intriguing commentary. And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. Still hasn't come yet, has it? What he's going to do, he doesn't break out until further down in the chapter in verse 18. And all of these are preparatory comments. Look at the strength of verse 14, my dear brothers. This is the personality of verse 14. Thus saith the Lord God, in that day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, you sneak. You've waited until you've lowered them off into false security and now you're going to go and they're my people. There's the feeling of God. There's a lot more to our Ezekiel 38 than sometimes we ever read. That's a a comment of extreme feeling. 
Many people with a huge crowd of people, an unprecedented assault upon the, the nations of the world, and thou shalt come up against my people of Israel. Ever felt that before? The strength of that? He's not just saying you'll come south a lot of people. He's saying you're coming against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. Hopeless to overcome it. It shall be in the latter days. And I will bring thee against thy land, my land. See that again. That the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time? By my servants the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them? My servants the prophets. This is an historic personality. It's something that's been written in the mind of God and in our scriptures in some sections for a long time, says God. It's a day to be remembered. My dear brothers and sisters, Don appealed to us to fill the times. I've heard that uh, talk of Don's a couple of times, and it might be three times. But I cannot help feel that the power of it is to be able to do something with it in our lives. It's a real challenge to us, isn't it? Are our, are, our, are our lives changing day by day as we live in such a kaleidoscope of amazing things that are happening all around us? Doing the readings at home now, perhaps better as a family than what we did three months ago, six months ago. Are we? Or is it still a bit too much time at work and a little bit too less time with our children? It's our Wednesday nights like at Bible class. Attendance has improved. Well, still the old questions. Oh, well, don't think I can make it tonight. And I've got some other things I have to go to. And the children have got some appointments with this and with, with that and so on. The kind of things have been happening for years in our Christadelphian ecclesias. Slackening off. That's what we call it, isn't it, really? All arranging groups are aware of that. There's many ecclesias troubled by that. They see that, in fact... The times are upon us, but we're not, we're not adjusting to that. It's not a full whole that we would have on Wednesday nights. And sometimes, well, we, we don't think that we need to really bother about some of the meetings. And if we're the slightest bit uh, not so well, that seems to be enough in many cases to say, well, I don't think I can make it tonight. But really, these are real things. This is an historic event. We are in the middle of it. You and me. Got to make a change to our lives. The responsibility is greater according to the increased understanding that we have. It's never been a generation that have seen what we've seen. Rightly said that for 41 years we have said when Britain went in she will come out. We've all heard that many, many times, haven't we? Among ourselves. We just couldn't fit it in. How could it be that Britain goes into Europe? Well, she did. Stayed there for 43 years. Last two months she's gone out. And we're excited about that. But how has that affected? There's the question, isn't it? Mightily interesting. Tremendously interesting. But the question really does come home to us. How has that affected my life? The life of my family. The life of my ecclesia. More concerned about what's happening ecclesially. Gone and seen those folk that needed a little bit of help here and there that young person that was finding it a bit rough and so on. Is that where our lives are going? Because that's really what in the end it must mean. So in Ezekiel verse 13 we have a key verse for our study this afternoon. There's three powers involved. This is the king of the south. It must be. There's no other alternative. If the Gog power is coming from the north, then the alternative, verse 13, must be generated in the south. And intriguingly, it's not Tarshish that we speak of so much that's first mentioned. It's Shiva and Eden. Why should that be? I suppose one good reason is they're right sitting underneath what's coming. It's going to affect them in a more direct country way than it's going to fit 
going to affect the kings, the uh, ships of Tarshish and the merchants thereof. But it is interesting to notice that Sheba and Dedan are the first that are mentioned. That uh, they're related to Abraham in Genesis chapter 25. It tells us that they're of Keturah, which we probably remember is true, and that Keturah had a number of children. Verse 2 says she bare him Zimram, Jokshan, and Medan, and Midian, and Ishbak, and Shua. And picking up the second of those, Jokshan, it says that Jokshan begat Sheba and Dedan and then tells us who the sons of Dedan were. That's interesting, isn't it? These are direct relatives to Isaac and to his, uh, his, fa- his son Jacob. They were children of Abraham through Keturah. And the first mentioned was Sheba. So it's curious for us I'm sure as it would have been to Ezekiel, to find in verse 13 that this strange group of people that dwelt out in the the area basically of Saudi Arabia, that they were linked with the merchants of Tarshish and with all the young lions developed from him. So there's three groups in there, Sheba and Dedan, then the merchants of Tarshish and all the young lions thereof. But Sheba and Dedan are mentioned first. Roughly speaking, those areas of Sheba and Dedan are are within the confines of the very large country of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is a very large place, but only 5% of it is uh, arable. Excuse the pun, it wasn't intended. But... uh, 5% 5% of that country is only is useful for any sense of growth. It's basically rock and sand with almost a nil rainfall. And sometimes you'll feel, find that some feel that Dedan's more this way or that way or that Sheba's more this way or that way. I was told when I was a boy that Dedan was down here on the, the southwest corner and that the port of Aden, which is at the point of that uh, corner... Uh, that took its name, Aden, from Dedan. And I suppose that's possibly still true. Because it's not easy to say where you might find those, because scripture itself sometimes has those names designated in a different way, because of that, I don't think that's the big issue. They were wanderers anyway. What is true is that they were members of a very large peninsula called Saudi Arabia today. And if we were to make a list of those uh, countries that take up that area, this would be the list, something like this. Saudi Arabia, obviously, by far the greater part. Qatar and Bahrain, of course, are in the Persian Gulf. There's the Emirates, Muscat and Oman, and Yemen, right down in the corner where it's nominated here as Sheba. Then Jordan, which is uh, up where that area of Kedar is marked on the map. And uh, then to Egypt, of course, which is uh, at the very south section, includes some of Egypt, although Daniel tells us that Egypt believed that she would escape the northern invader. So they are essentially the the countries in the world today that are grouped together in this term Sheba and Dedan. There was until recent years no real borders. and There wouldn't be, even today I'm sure, in many cases could you go and find an actual border, a fence that says this is is, uh, Emirates and this is uh, Muscat and this is Omen. It hasn't ever been like that. It's only when the British came into that area after World War I that they sort of drew this up. Churchill said of Jordan, he said, Jordan, he said, will be our friends, he said, because I I made it up one Saturday afternoon on my desk. He just drew the line and that was Jordan. 
That's how it was after World War II, World War I. There was hardly any industrial development in Saudi Arabia. But it did have uh, an ancient relationship with Israel. Now this is interesting. Let's come back to the days of Solomon in the first of Kings chapter 10. This is the time when the Queen of Sheba visited Solomon. Interestingly, Jesus calls her the Queen of the South, which is interesting, the Queen of the South. Luke chapter 11 and verse 29. So we read of uh, her coming in uh, chapter 10, when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of Yahweh, she came to prove him with hard questions. Underline her interest. Her main point of interest was concerning the name of Yahweh. This lady is a very special person. She didn't come for anything higher than her great interest about the God of Israel. And it's on that note, verse 9, that she closed her account. Blessed be Yahweh thy God, which delighted in thee to set thee on the throne of Israel because, because Yahweh loved Israel. What did she know about Israel? What did she know about Yahweh's love of Israel? What did she know about the history of Israel? Set thee on the throne of Israel because Yahweh loved Israel forever. Now there's something that's gone through there, isn't there, from Keturah, from Abraham. There's something that 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 lady knows about the history of Israel. must be the case. I've never seen that in the record before, but I can see it now. Because Yahweh loved Israel forever, therefore made he the king to do judgment and justice. And she brought some wonderful gifts. Verse 2. She came to Jerusalem with a very great train, with camels that bear spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she commanded, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. Some pretty good gifts, weren't they? And again, look in verse 10. She gave the king 120 talents of gold and of spices, very great store. And precious stones, there came no more such abundance of spices as these which, which the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. So, this was a very special visit from a very special person to Solomon's presence in Jerusalem. She looked at all the things that he had and she was just absolutely overcome with the wonder of it all. But the thing that impressed her most was when she saw the descent by which Solomon went up into the house of Yahweh. It says in verse, verse 5, the meat of his table, the sitting of his servants, there was a dignity, a poise, everything was done in the best taste, and the attendance of his ministers, and their apparel, and his cupbearers, and his ascent by which he went up unto the house of Yahweh. And when she saw that, there was no more spirit left in her. She was just overcome by the brilliance of Jerusalem in the reign of Solomon. But she didn't put that down to Solomon alone. She had put it down to the God who put Solomon there. This is a very remarkable lady. It's no wonder that she came to Jerusalem. Of all the other people that did come, because it says in this, this same chapter that many people from many countries came to Jerusalem. We don't even know who they were. But we have this lengthy account about this particular woman. This is Sheba. She's the queen of Sheba, Sheba and Dedan. This is the history of that people and the history of that people with Israel. There is a history. It's a very interesting thing to see there. Right at the end of the time, there's a Sheba involved in the final descent of Go. So, uh, over in the rest of that chapter, it, it notes the things which uh, she brought. It says in verse 12, The king made of the Almug trees pillars for the house of Yahweh and for the king's house, harps also and salt trees for singers, there came no such almug trees, nor were seen unto this day. So like they had taken cedars in the Mediterranean and taken them from Lebanon and brought them down to, uh, 
to Israel along the sea, so also there were trees that were brought from the area from which he came. And it says in verse 13, And King Solomon gave unto the Queen of Sheba all her desire, whatsoever she asked, beside that which Solomon gave her of his royal bounty. So she turned and went to her own country and, and her servants. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon one year was 600 threescore and six talents of gold which happens to be 666 talents of gold, interestingly, beside that he had of the merchant men and of the traffic of the spice merchants and of all the kings of Arabia and of the governors of the country. So this is not just a single person's fascination with Israel, is it? This is a lady that's representing a whole region of people from Saudi Arabia, as we might put it, or Sheba and Dedan and the other peoples that were in that area. And that's all coming to Solomon, to Israel. Spice merchants and and of all the kings of Arabia and of the governors of the country. Verse 22 outlines some more of it, but it's more interesting. It says in verse 22, For the king had at sea a navy of Tarshish with the navy of Hiram. Once in three years came the navy of Tarshish bringing gold and silver, ivory and apes and peacocks. So here we have Tarshish involved in the very area that she's come from and it's an eastern Tarshish for the goods that that they brought are mentioned. Gold and silver, ivory and apes and peacocks. Now you don't get... uh, ivory from anything else than elephants. And you don't get any elephants on the coast of France or the coast of the Mediterranean, do you? They belong to uh, to India, as, of course, do apes and peacocks. It's interesting that an English poet in a poem that was called Cargoes spoke once, didn't he? He wrote this. He said, uh, dirty British coaster with a salt cake smokestack butting through the channel in the mad March days, with a cargo of ivory, apes and peacocks, sandalwood, cedarwood and sweet white wine. I had to learn that at school and stuff. Well, I find it intriguing because it's showing that when he wrote that John Macefield, which was, I think, in the early, early uh, 20, 20th century, he was a poet laureate at the time, when he wrote that, they were the things which he knew came to Britain at that time. And of course they came through the Suez Canal from India, when India was the crown of the, of the British people. Exactly the same. It's all a rerun of history, isn't it? What Britain did in the 19th and 20th centuries had been done before with the kings of Arabia and the, she- the Queen of Sheba. So it was a very major thing. And it all came really from further east. So they traffic along the coast, they slip through, well they couldn't slip through the sewers. Does that mean therefore that that part of Tarshish which was found on the east was separate from that which, for example, Jonah used when he, he caught a boat going to Tarshish? No, it doesn't. And they've actually discovered more recently that there are indications, little things that have been found, that, that show that Tarshish did go round the uh, African continent and came up the other side and therefore into the Mediterranean. So there was an eastern Tarshish and there was a western Tarshish. But they were somewhat related as we might expect that to be. You only have to think about that in terms of, of Britain and you can see that the whole thing has been played again, hasn't it? Having a definite and strong connection in India and the other countries nearby India and therefore also a tremendous trading outlet in the western side as well. And as a principle over that, you really had Thai, which was of course up on the Phoenician coast, on the Mediterranean coast. So that was the principal city around which those things were happening and Tarshish was travelling, its representatives were travelling, as they were on the east, as they were on the west, but Tyre was the centre of it. And so in uh, 
1 to Kings chapter 10 and verse 22, we have echoes of things that were to come a couple of thousands of years later. That's a very interesting piece of background. If we look in Isaiah 23, a little verse in the beginning of that chapter. This afternoon we read from verse 6, didn't we? In Isaiah 3, shows us the very strong connection that Tyre had with Tarshish. So that this chapter, which is a deluge against Tyre, the destruction of the, of the city of Tyre and of its uh, consequences, it's natural, therefore, that her traders, her principal traders, the ships of Tarshish, are mentioned in this chapter, and they are a number of times. Verse 1, again in verse 6, Pass you over to Tarshish, verse 10, and again in verse 14. So the connections between Tyre and uh, Tarshish are very keen to see. It's uh, quite a thrill to see how much that is echoed in the history of Britain as well. Now that trading ability is quite an astonishing thing. It didn't always remain just in Tyre, because Tyre was eclipsed. Where did it go then? Well, it went to places like Venice and Genoa on the Italian coast, or Carthage on the North African coast, as opportunities came and went. Later on, when you got to later centuries, like the 16th century, 17th century and so on, uh, then countries came involved in that as well. Holland was one, Spain was another. And, of course, Portugal was another. So it wasn't always Britain that was perhaps at the, at the head of the merchant side of the world. Those other countries and cities became centres of it as well. Right, so I'd like to make a few comments about the really unique nature of British attachment to the sea. If I was to ask you, who do you know in your life that went to sea? Was there any boy in your class that when he finished it, he went to sea? I can't think of anyone in my class. It's some good swimmers, but they didn't go to sea. <laughs> but there isn't, is there? Australians very rarely seem to end up in that occupation of life. But Britain, with a, a mere about 10 million people, on a country that was no bigger than the state of Victoria... I suppose you'd think but it's a small state with just 10 million people it had control and developed something like 48 countries now that's an astonishing achievement isn't it I suppose because it wasn't attached to land it therefore there was, it created a natural, a natural thought to go beyond the very limited nature of its coastline fair enough But it's also a special thing in history to have, surely, any nation that's ever attempted to have anything like that degree of dominance or interest in world trade. And I remember once in San Diego there was a windjammer there in the the harbour and you could go and visit this and it had a a chart up all about about Britain and and what Britain's uh, trading interests did to the world trade. And it said... It was British world trade interests, maritime interests, that vastly changed the trading in the world. That was a fresh thought of thought for me. But when you think about it, you can see why, can't you? If you're landlocked, if you stay in your own country, then you trade with your neighbour. But if you go onto the seas, then you can trade with anybody, of course. But nobody seems to have seen that like the, the British people did. Not only that, but but, uh, sailing wasn't an an easy thing. It was a dangerous thing. Because there were, almost always, the coasts to be followed. And the coasts might have rocks and small islands and all sorts of things. And therefore the country that worked out and charted all of those ways to go was well ahead, weren't they? From those that had not done that. And Britain put their mind to that. And they really became experts in the, in the channels of the, of the seas of the world. Even crossing to the, the new world, they knew the best way to go. And so eventually 
they dominated in that area. Such a dominance, can you imagine this? We have Australians in this day, I'm sure. But can you imagine that when uh, another vessel of some other country crossed the pathway of an English ship, they actually lowered their flag in deference uh, to the British flag. Now, I know Donald thinks that's marvellous, but we find that a bit hard to believe, don't we? <laughs> it's an amazing thing. It really is. It was a recognition by the, by the countries of the world that Britain ruled the waves. It was no exaggeration. Britannia rules the world, the waves. A quite astonishing fact of history. And I found it very interesting to think about that in the terms of what we're looking about in Ezekiel or in Solomon's days. It's a unique situation that they enjoyed, that that smallish country had so many people that went to sea. Robert Roberts, what did Robert Roberts' uh, father do? He was a ship captain, wasn't he? What did some of his sons do? They too also went to sea in some turn. So uh, very many remarkable things happened because of that. And uh, particularly when uh, Drake, for example, uh, defeated uh, the Spaniards and uh, then later there was Nelson who defeated uh, Napoleon's fleet, the um, Spanish French fleet, uh, at Trafalgar, it was then that Britain was absolutely on top of the, the situation in the world. Then on until, well, well into the 20th century, that was the situation. It's fascinating history, isn't it? That's why it's been so remarkably interesting to see this brought into Ezekiel at the end. Because not only as a defence power, but also in a, in a role that was yet to come in bringing Israel back, a seafaring country was required. Think of uh, 48 nations that have been developed. You know, if you develop a nation, you've got to have some, some good judgement, don't you? You've got to have some good schooling. You've got to be able to set up a government and, and, a, and a system of roads and a system of uh, policing and uh, various government departments that any country re requires, a parliament. That's a tremendous amount of responsibility. To do that 48 times over is just simply astonishing, isn't it? I think Australia is struggling at the moment to have one government we can get going in some degree of conformity. And, uh, and uh, 48 countries, they were built really by the work of the, of the, sh of the ships of Tarshish and their, their people. Another thing that uh, I saw once was a photo, not a photo, but it was a painting. And uh, it was a painting of the Southampton dockyards. My difference is I've never seen anything like it. For as long, far as you could see, there was dockyards in this painting. Southampton's at the, at the base of Britain. And it really opened my eyes as to how enormous this enterprise was. There would have literally been almost a hundred ships being built along these wharfs. That's a vast enterprise, a huge enterprise. Around the corner there was another whole lot that went up that way and the Thames also had their shipbuilding. So that's how it affected the country. A huge part of its interest was invested in this sense of trading. That's how it happened. You might know the port called Newport in, in Wales probably don't even know where Newport is, but if you go to Wales, they'll tell you. Newport became the busiest port in the world. And I didn't know about it until I went there. But it was the busiest because at one stage, all the ships of Tarshish, all the ships of Britain, came back to Newport to re-coal because it had the coal that suited their, uh, their steamships that had then been developed. Fascinating things, aren't they? gone past us and certainly the rising generation I'm sure would find that very interesting information indeed. Different what we've seen of Britain most most different indeed but that was the situation even when it came to the Suez Canal who got the Suez Canal? Why is it called Suez? Because the architect was a Frenchman but it didn't belong to the French did it? It belonged strangely and peculiarly to the British because their Prime Minister, when he saw that the share market for the Suez 
Canal shares was down. He went to Queen Victoria one Sunday and asked her that she would make a check out to buy the Suez Canal. And so the Suez Canal became British, even though it had a French name and a French origin. Amazing things. All in the same story, my dear brothers and I, I found all that very wonderfully significant and interesting. The most favoured of my quotations of, of uh, John Thomas, I think, is this one. I know not whether the men who at present contrive the foreign policy of Britain entertain the idea of assuming the sovereignty of the Holy Land and of promoting its colonisation by the Jews. Their present intentions, however, are of no importance one way or the other because they will be compelled by events soon to happen to do what under existing circumstances heaven and earth combined could not move them to attempt. The finger of God has indicated a course to be pursued by Britain which cannot be evaded and which her councillors will not only be willing but eager to adopt when the crisis comes upon them. And the crisis did come upon them out of World War I and they were there at that time because they'd been in Egypt and then they were next door to, to Palestine and the Turks were playing up and there was opportunity in 1915 and then 1916 after Gallipoli to, to move into that area and they of course did that. That's a highly significant thing. We think of that in the purpose of God, my dear brothers, it's a very blessed opportunity for any nation to have that to their credit, that in the midst of, of this crisis of all the nations, they were able to put into effect what God had said to Abraham and allow that people to come back and ensure that they would. All right. They were sometimes cruel and sometimes inconsistent. But nevertheless, some nation had to do it. And God said it will be the uh, finger of Britain, he, as Dr Thomas has pointed out there. What an amazing thing. The same with World War II. Britain again was found in that area and ended up, of course, being in, in control of, uh, of the territory after the war. And so that led to the nationhood of Israel. They're great things, aren't they? Great things in history. All that's behind the fact that they are there in Ezekiel chapter 38 as uh, final interest takers in the matters that happen in Ezekiel 38. Well, the other group that are there in Ezekiel 38 are called the Young Lions. That's a, an amazing description, really, of the third element of this South Confederacy. 2,600 years ago, this description was given that they would be the Young Lions of uh, Tarshish. What relationship would Tashif have with Sheba and Dedan 2,600 years later? What an amazing record. We just read it. But my dear and sisters, that's just a phenomenal thing in the Bible, isn't it? 2,600 years before it happened, there was evidence, once investigated, that it would be Britain that would be involved in that. How would you ever imagine that such a detail was put into Ezekiel all that many years beforehand? I wonder why, how ever did it happen? Why was Sheba and Dedan related to the ships of Tarshish at that time? How did it happen? Well, I never really knew until recently exactly what those steps were, but in the next few slides you'll see exactly how it did happen. 1922. There are a number of, call them kings if you like, kings of Arabia, to use that term back in First Chronicles chapter 1922. Ibn Saud created the empire of Saudi Arabia. He was a British ally who, value, who valued his new connections with European powers. As ally, Ibn Saud had, above other tribal leaders of the Arabian desert, unique appeal his need for weapons and finance was sufficiently unbounded to make him amenable to the will of the donors. So some of these princes that lived in the area of Saudi Arabia obviously used the trade that came up and down through the Red Sea. And Ibn Saud, hitherto in my experience, unknown completely by that name, he uh, became friendly with the 
the British as they were travelling up and down. Well, that's, that's exactly the story, isn't it, that we're looking for. How come alongside Sheba and Dedan does it mention the ships of Tush? This is the story. The British were passing through and this man had a pill and he had money. Because he had money, he therefore wanted to have some defence for his country, so he talked to the British. They were very happy to see him selling weapons and improve his security. It was an even, even playing field, of course. This is Britain's Secretary of State, the first Earl of Crewe. Sounds very grand, and he looks very grand indeed. Well, he pithily summed up the British objective. What we want is not a united Arabia, but a disunited Arabia split into principalities large enough for our suzerainty. A little bit um, excess, doesn't it? But that was the British attitude. The place was really wide open for colonisation and uh, redraft. And that's what Britain did. And it's by members as humble as Mr Crewe that uh, it was done. Britain quietly supported Ibn Sword in a series of conquests that in 1927 brought him recognition of Hijaj, a title changed to King of Saudi Arabia in 1932. So he became the King of Hijaj and then that title was changed and he became King of Saudi Arabia in 1932. Is that interesting? 1932 is only four years before oil is found in the sands of Saudi Arabia. Before that was, it was found... Saudi Arabia was a very different value than after 1936. Six years later, in 1938, oil was discovered in Saudi Arabia and Britain was already in the place of advantage. So Britain has had a long-standing relationship with Saudi Arabia and with America, has been locked into a conflict between Arab nationalism and the march of Zionism. On the one hand, they, they wanted now to make contact with these people that owned this great big desert. But they were Arabs and they were opposed to what, it, what, America, what Britain was doing in Israel for the Jewish people. And they had to balance those, those two things together. It was a very difficult match. But 1938 made uh, Saudi Arabia very, very important, of course. Well, this is just some of the pictures through the time. Here's... Uh, the Queen, our current Queen, when she was just a young, king, young Queen, and even there, she, together with Burrow, is uh, welcoming to London some of the sheiks, the kings of that area. It's a long relationship, isn't it? She's been there since. And they really did dress up for him. They really turned the show on. Look at that one. Slined with people in London. Who? Who's this? It's King Ibn Sword of Saudi Arabia, come to visit London. They've obviously now realised that uh, Saudi Arabia was exceedingly important to their cause. This is all building up, isn't it, to the little expression that Ezekiel says, Sheba and Dedan are the merchants of Tarshish. This is how it happened. The oil was discovered just at the right time, like it has been recently, just at the right time to discover it again for different purposes. But how interesting that is I mean, who ever got such a showy trip as that in all history? And, uh, of course, that's the Queen as well at a later stage in her life. And there is the uh, Lord of Saudi Arabia uh, with uh, Prince Charles. Here's some decors of the Saudi people. They don't do that for everybody. I don't think the Australian Prime Minister ever got that sort of treatment, did he? But uh, it just shows you, doesn't it, the British knew what they were doing when it came to Saudi Arabia, they knew they had a very, very wealthy uh, visitor. Older lady, not so long ago, that is, uh, he again special services. Now, I find this uh, exceedingly interesting. This is a project which is called Hatar al Batin. And the little dot of blue, which is there, is the centre of an operation that is nothing short of phenomenal. And it's happened just three months ago. And it involved amazing numbers of, of people. I'm going to show you where they are, but that's where the operations were. What else is it, Hatar al Batan? I doubt, doubt if there's anything. You'd be lucky to find a bush there. 
It's a totally unknown spot, really. But now it's a, a spot of extreme significance. What are we looking for? We're looking for something developing in the south that's going to, it's going to push at the north, something developing in the south that will be a, a deterrent to the plunge from the north. Could any of these powers really claim that they've ever thought seriously about that? Well, I don't think they really had thought seriously. When they did, they didn't have any answers. The time when they were very worried about it. You might remember that uh, Sadat in 19, about 1974, I think it was, as president of Egypt, he threw out 20,000 Russians. Do you remember that? Russia's been there before. This old hat for Russia... Putin knows it's old hat. He wants to put the old hat on again. He's determined it will be that way. He wants to go back and get hold of those lands where once they had 20,000 Russian soldiers and built the dam and so forth in Egypt. He has not forgotten that Russia had a border of influence very much beyond her own borders. He wants to get that back. And he had, of course, forces in Libya as well. Tunisia. Russia had considerable influence through that area, Egypt and so on. Well, it's very, very interesting, extremely interesting to find in our very recent history this story about Hatar al batin Now, here's an indication of the size of the project. Saudi Arabia initiated a massive military drill in which 20 nations participated. Do you believe that that the Arabs could have put together 20 nations to do that? Able to work together. 20 nations cooperated. 1,500 planes, 20,000 tanks in this forlorn and hopeless place, and 450 helicopters were involved in the exercise. Up to 350,000 troops from Gulf nations and other allies, such as Pakistan to the east, Jordan in the Middle East, Chad and Sudan, Chad in North Africa, Sudan in Africa as well, took part in the drill over 18 days in Hafar al Batin, showing their unity to the region and a message of defiance to Syria, Iran and Russia. Saudi Arabia was able to pull that off. And uh, the list of nations... I think I have put it in. These are the countries which joined with Saudi Arabia in the operation. Morocco, way out in Western Africa, Pakistan, East, Chad, Tunisia, Comoros, Djibouti, Oman, Qatar, Malaysia, Egypt, Mauritania, Mauritius, in addition to the Peninsula Shield Force. That's, that's serious work, isn't it? To be able to get that number of people together means that they have really done a huge amount of work. And when you look at the little type, you find that a lot of those nations were very cognizant of what they were doing and working it with Israel itself. Isn't that fascinating? Whoever would have dreamt that possible? It's only just a very short time that Saudi Arabian head of state said, my principal desire in life is to be able to, to, uh, to worship in Jerusalem. With a, 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 with, a, with a land which has no longer got Jews in it. That's what he said. And now, unbelievably, he's combining all these people together in this phenomenal exercise to prepare them for the king of the north. How remarkable, my dear brothers and sisters. I don't suppose he knows Ezekiel like we do, but if he did, what an amazing uh, observation it would be for him to see that. So that's called, that, uh, pro that uh, whole procession is called the Northern Thunder. Well, it's not actually north, is it? We call it the Southern Thunder because he's the king of the south. But uh, it's the Northern Thunder in so much that it's, it's above uh, uh, Egypt and it's above Saudi Arabia, or most of Saudi Arabia. Then, just uh, very recently, we came across this. Much in the, the last one, didn't say much about it, but, but this one does. Jordan and the USA, this is just a week or two old, are strengthening military relationships. And of all titles, they have called it Eagle Lion 
2016 in line with a remarkable echo of Ezekiel 38. If all the names that they could have thought in this relationship, this special new relationship between Jordan and the USA, Jordan's never been far away from the USA, but this is something that they obviously got together because they're mutually concerned and they want to clean up the Sinai and they want to give strength uh, to the borders of Jordan and Jordan looks very vulnerable, doesn't it? And so, <laughs> gets together with the USA and they call the exercise Eagle Lion 2016. What an amazing thing. And in the... Uh, so that they have the symbol of it. And I thought, isn't that simply amazing? Eagle, I suppose, it's, that's America. But the, what they chose was so much in conformity with the symbols that we've seen on this subject. And I suppose the other thing, my dear brothers and sisters, that is truly remarkable about all of this is the fines of oil and gas, both in Israel and uh, in the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, just north of Egypt. Do you know that the gas that's been found in that area is said to be perhaps equal to any gas field found in the world to this time? These are not small things. These are massive things. What Israel has found in the, in the Mediterranean, just off from Cyprus and, and so on, they're enormous ventures. And there's the, the king of the north running around now desperate with, with his... Is, uh, is notes to make uh, an agreement with Israel about that gas, or with Egypt about their gas, or with Israel about its oil. How amazing that is, my dear brothers and sisters. Wasn't it spoil that was mentioned by the prophecy? I can remember Brother Peirce once calling, saying that the spoil is oil. And we all thought, oh, that's a bit quaint. But lo and behold, we'd all think that's not bad, is it, today? The spoil is oil and gas, isn't it? It was never found for all those years. Now these countries are feeling the pressure is upon them. Well, my dear brothers and sisters, really, the pressure is upon us, isn't it? Who else know those things? Who else cares? Do you care? Do you care? And we want our children, we want our, our teenage children to know those things and be serious enough to bind up their minds to take in what that really means to us in our families, in our ecclesias and in our Christadelphian brotherhood. We are a very blessed people indeed. May God help us to hold tight and hold high the things that have been given to us and bind our ecclesias together in, in wonderful things of which God has made us the privilege. Retainer. Thank you.